Well, hello, hello, hello for you, and welcome to Rational Equations. I can solve rational inequalities and state restrictions on the variables. Sorry, my voice is a little bit rough. Just bear with me. So we're solving rational inequalities today. Um, and even though we didn't actually solve using cross-multiplying when we solved equalities, uh, we could have. And some of you may fall back on cross-multiplying if you like cross-multiplying rather than multiplying through by a common denominator. I just want you to know that you cannot use cross-multiplying in any way, shape, or form uh, when you're solving an inequality. Uh, because if you, s when you multiply an inequality by a negative number, uh, you must flip the sign. And since expressions contain an unknown um, that will be both positive or negative depending on the value of that unknown, or in this case x, uh, it's impossible to tell which way the sign should flip. And so if it's impossible to tell which way the sign should be flipped, we just can't do it. So we cannot solve using cross multiplying. Equalities, if you solve an equality with a cross multiplication, that's fine. Inequalities, uh -uh, can't do it. Okay. So to solve, we're simply going to get everything to one side and put it all together in a single rational expression. And what that means is that we're going to have to have a lot of practice using a common denominator. You wondered why you were doing all of that last year, didn't you? Uh, now it's coming back to haunt you. Um, we'll do an interval check for each factor, or we can actually graph it instead of doing an interval check, but rational expressions are a little bit harder to do a rough sketch of than polynomial inequalities. Um, so you might find yourself with something that looks like this, and we don't really deal with this a whole lot, so you may want to fall back on doing an interval test. Uh, now, I've given us this funny equation. It's got a cubic thing in the middle, so this is probably a reciprocal cubic function. Um, so I want you to notice that the, where the function switches from positive to negative. So if I'm traveling along on this function, just minding my own business, I'm in the positives, I'm in the positives, I'm in the positives, whoop, I've flipped into the negatives. Right there is where I went from positive to negatives, and this thing right here is called a zero. Okay, now I'm going to keep traveling along. I'm in the negatives, I'm in the negatives, I'm in the negatives, and I'm going to keep going negative, 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 because I've hit an asymptote. So if I want to keep going this direction, I have to get off of this thing, because it's just going to keep going to negative infinity. And notice that when I get off it and I start to travel in this direction, I immediately jump up here. So it also switches from positive to negative right along this line that goes down here at an asymptote. So there's another interesting point, the which is an asymptote. So it switches from positive to negative at the zero, and then if I keep going left to right, it switches from uh, negative to positive at this asymptote. Now I'm going to keep following this. I'm going to do it a little bit faster than I did before. Um, right here, it's going to switch from positive to negative, and this thing is also a zero because it crosses the x-axis. And once again, this is going to go shoot off way down to negative infinity unless I hop off the tracks. And when I hop off the tracks, I have to immediately jump into the positive range. So somewhere in between these two branches, there is an asymptote, and at that asymptote, this is going to switch from negative to positive. So if you're getting the picture, or at least I hope you're getting the picture, that the intervals that are bounding this thing, the intervals where we have some things positive and some things negative, are bounded by not only the zeros, but also bounded by the asymptotes. Um, so for rational expression, our interval boundaries will be both zeros and vertical asymptotes. Um, for zeros, the numerator is zero. For vertical asymptotes, the denominator is zero. And this is nothing new to us, but it bears repeating. Remember, if the numerator is zero, the whole thing is zero. If the denominator is zero, then we've got an issue where it doesn't exist, and so that's an asymptote. So let's have a look at how to solve these things, since I've talked at you for four, 47 sec 4 minutes 47 seconds. 50 seconds, 51, okay, carry on. Anyway, we're going to solve this one by sketching, but we have to do uh, a little bit of rearranging first. 
um, to try and get it all in one uh, one expression. Uh, if you can sketch it, if it's something easy like a reciprocal quadratic or like a linear over a linear, you can do a rough sketch of it. Um, and this one we're going to get a common denominator for. And I'm going to say that first. And then we're going to carry it out. So I'm going to get a common denominator and I'm going to go and use a different color here. Um, my common denominator in this case, well the denominator of this is 1. So I just need to make it have a denominator of 3x plus 7. Now this numerator, this 2, already has a denominator of 3x plus 7. So it doesn't need any adjustment to it whatsoever. And then I'm going to subtract 4. The 4 used to have a denominator of 1. It needs the 3x plus 7. And of course this whole thing needs to be less than 0. Now the top becomes 2 minus 12x minus 28 over 3x plus 7. And that's less than 0. And now putting the top together I'm going to have negative 12x and minus 26. all over 3x plus 7. And of course that has to be less than or equal to 0. So we're going to do a rough sketch of this thing. So I'm just going to draw this over here. And of course let's put our little arrow heads on the end of that. And let's take a look. Uh, where is our asymptotes? Where are our um, zeros? So the horizontal asymptote, now this is just a linear over a linear, so you got to remember what we did a couple days ago. The horizontal asymptote is going to be negative 12 divided by 3. Remember, if we multiply both top and bottom by 1 over x, these x's are going to go away. And when we let it go to infinity, these are going to go away, so I'm going to be left with negative 12 over 3. Negative 12 over 3 which equals negative 4. So therefore we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals negative 4. So I'm going to put that on there. y equals negative 4 is our horizontal asymptote. All right, now our vertical asymptote occurs when the denominator is 0. So our vertical asymptote is going to occur when this thing this thing, 3x over 7 is 0. So our vertical asymptote is going to be x equals, remember constant term over coefficient opposite sign, negative 7 thirds. So we've got a vertical asymptote of negative 7 thirds, um, which if I put it on here, it's going to be over here. It's going to be negative 2 and 1 third is what negative 7 thirds is, x equals. Now we want the zeros. So zeros occur, whoops, not that. Zeros occur when the numerator is 0. So if uh, negative 12x minus 26 equals 0 is going to give us a 0. And when I rearrange that, I'm going to add 26 and divide it by 12. So we get, or divide by negative 12, so I get x equals negative 26 over 12 or um, negative 13 over 6 when we reduce it to lowest terms. So this is our 0, x equals negative 13 over 6 which is negative 2 and 1 sixth. So negative 2 and 1 sixth is going to be right here. This is negative 2 and a third. Negative 2 and a sixth is not quite to it, but it's pretty darn close. So I'm going to go whoop. This is x equals negative 2 and 1 sixth. Uh, and of course, y equals 0. So now we've actually got enough to graph this thing. As soon as I put this on, if we're just doing a rough sketch, this is a creeper graph. I know how this is going to look. It's going to go like this and along there. Maybe should have done it in another color, but and then this one's going to be down here because we know what these things look like. So once we've got on our zeros and we've got on our asymptotes, we can just do a rough sketch of it.
Now I'm only interested in when this thing is less than zero, so I'm going to take my highlighter and I'm going to highlight all the spots where it's less than zero. And then I'm going to turn that into an answer. It is less than zero when x is in the interval negative infinity to this asymptote to the negative, um, negative 7 thirds. Negative infinity to negative 7 thirds. And then from this point to positive infinity, so we can put a comma there, then from negative uh, 26, well, negative 2 and a sixth, or negative 13 sixths, right up to positive infinity. So there's our answer. Those are the values of x that will make this thing uh, be less than zero. Okay. Now, but what happens with something like this? I'm going to use an interval test here. Uh, this is not some. This is a quadratic over a quadratic. We've never sketched a quadratic over a quadratic. Um, so if we don't have never sketched a quadratic over a quadratic, we should probably um, maybe do an interval test. Uh, so taking a look here, I need to know the zeros and I need to know the vertical asymptotes. This is already factored. If I give you an expression that's not already factored, you're going to need to factor it. Uh, from this, we can tell when the zero, where what the zeros and the asymptotes are, very easily. Remember, we get the zeros from the top. The zeros occur when the top is zero, and the asymptotes occur when the bottom is zero. So our zeros are going to be negative three and positive four, and our vertical asymptotes are going to be positive seven and positive two. And now we're going to have to set up our interval test and test to see what sign the function is. So I'm just going to set up my interval chart. Okay, now there's the start of my interval chart. Notice I put all of the factors in here. Doesn't matter if they're on the top or the bottom. If I have two negatives on top and two negatives on the bottom, my net result is I have four negatives. And so an even number of negatives make the whole thing positive. Um, so we can test them and test them exactly the same as we would if they were just a string of multiplications. So now I'm going to set up my intervals. My intervals are going to be from negative infinity to negative 3 and from negative 3 to my next one which is going to be positive 2. Then we go from positive 2 to the next one which is going to be positive 4 and then positive 4 goes to the next one which is positive 7 and then 7 goes to positive infinity. So those are all my intervals. They're bounded by both zeros and asymptotes and now I just have to double check these. Now I'm going to go through and talk you through the first one and then I'm just going to go through and do the rest of them and we, um, hopefully you understand the interval test a little bit better after this. These are really big negative numbers. Let's say like negative 10. Well, that's not really big but negative 10 is within this interval. If I put negative 10 in here, my answer negative 10 plus 3 is going to still be negative. Negative 10 minus 4 is negative. Negative 10 minus 7 is negative. Negative 10 minus 2 is negative. Four negatives, it's an even number of negatives, make the overall value of the function positive. Okay, now I'm going to do one more. Pick a number within this interval. In this interval, the nicest number is 0. If I plug 0 in for x in all of these factors, what sign do I get? Well, 0 plus 3 is positive. 0 minus 4 is negative. 0 minus 7 is negative. And 0 minus 2 is negative. I've got three negatives, which mean overall this thing is negative. And so there we're all done. Now we just have to interpret this. Now I want this where it's less than or equal to zero. So all of the places where this is less than zero are these negative intervals. So these negative intervals give us our answer. So this interval, x lies in the interval from negative three to two. Now we just have to decide, do I want round brackets or square brackets? I know this has an equal to, so you might say, oh, well, you want square brackets. However, one of these things is an asymptote. 
the 2 is an asymptote and it can never be equal to an asymptote so at the asymptote we have to have a round bracket um, here is a 0 so it can be equal to 0 at the 0 so we have to have a square bracket on that one now this one here x is an element of well 4 to 7 7 is the asymptote so at 4 we can have the square bracket but at 7 we have to have the round bracket and of course we could write these out the other way we could say therefore x has to lie between negative 3 and positive 2 but it's let then we put our less than signs that way and we put an equal to sign at negative 3 because negative 3 is a 0 and um, also x lies between 4 and 7 put our less than signs there but 4 is a 0 so we can put the equal to there. So that's got that one done. Now lastly we have one where we're gonna have to simplify um, before we do an interval test or anything else to solve this. So we're gonna have to do some work here. So I need to get a common denominator. So I'm gonna write that. See just wrote it. Isn't the pause button magical? Okay, now since we're going to get a common denominator, I'm going to write this down. The common denominator we're going to get is this multiplied together. x plus 1 times x minus 2. And this is going to have to be less than 0. Now, this numerator had an x, and its denominator was x plus 1, so it needs the x minus 2. So I need to multiply top and bottom by x minus 2 minus 2x and then its bottom is x minus 2 it needs the x plus 1 so since I multiply the bottom by x plus 1 I have to multiply the top by x plus 1 as well now expand and simplify so we get x squared minus 2x um, minus 2x squared minus 2x that's going to be all over x plus 1 times x minus 2 It's less than or equal to 0. Now when I put stuff together I'm going to get a negative x squared on top and then a negative 2x and a negative 2x is negative 4x and that has to be over x plus 1 x minus 2. Now I can take out a common factor on top and the common factor I'm going to take out on top is negative x. And when I take out a negative x, I'm left with x plus 4. Now there's nothing to simplify. If I could simplify, I would. I can't, so I won't. Uh, that has to be less than 0. Now we're going to set up my interval table, but first I have to decide what are my zeros and what are my asymptotes. Well, my zeros are when the numerator is 0. So the numerator is 0 when x is 0 from this factor here or when x is negative 4 from that factor there. But how about the vertical asymptotes? The vertical asymptotes occur when the denominator is 0. So the two vertical asymptotes are going to be negative 1 and positive 2. So those are going to give me my intervals. So here's my interval table. Now I put all of the factors here including I put in the the 1 up here and included it as its own factor of negative 1. So the top is like negative 1 times x times x plus 4 uh, and I just included that in there. So now I'm going to go through in this interval negative infinity to negative 4. Well first of all negative 1 is negative in every single interval. So I'm going to go through and put that down there. Now x here um, is going to be negative in this interval, negative in this interval, uh, negative in this interval, positive in this interval, and positive in this interval. Uh, x plus 4, these are really big negative numbers, so when I add 4 to them, they're just going to stay negative. These ones here, I have, say, negative 2 in that interval. When I add 4 to it, it's going to be positive. Uh, these ones here, um, let's say negative a half is in that interval so when I add 4 it's positive. These are both positive intervals so they're going to be positive. Now when I add 1 to a big negative number it's still negative. 
When I add 1 to any ones in this interval, it's still negative. When I add 1 to ones in this interval, it takes me over the positive. So it's positive there. And since these are positives, so when I add 1 to them, they're going to be positive. Now, big negative numbers subtract 2 is negative. From negative 4 to negative 1, those are negative numbers. When I subtract 2, they're negative. These ones are also negative, so when I subtract, they're negative. 0 to 2, those are positive, so that's going to be positive. And 2 to infinity is positive, so that's going to be positive. So let's have a look at our f at x. I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 negatives means it's negative. 1, 2, 3, 4 negatives, that's even, means it's positive. 1, 2, 3, negative, 1, negative negative, ooh, stay a negative in there, and then 1 is negative, so it's negative in all of those intervals there. Um, and I actually just spotted a mistake here. These ones say 1 is in this interval here. If 1 is in this interval here when I subtract 2, that's going to be a negative there. So that's a negative which makes 2 even negatives, so we get a positive there. Now sometimes it will occur that you'll have three negative in intervals in a row, um, but if you do get a couple in a row and you think it maybe isn't going to be that way, you should probably check and see if you have a mistake. So we're looking for when this thing is less than zero. So if it's less than zero and we've got no equal twos here whatsoever, I'm only looking for the negative intervals. This one, this one, and this one. So we can say x is within the interval negative infinity to negative 4, and we have round brackets because we don't want any of the zeros. Uh, this one, x is within the interval negative 1 to 0. We're not really, we don't care where it's equal to 0. There's no equal to there, so we can just leave it as this, the round brackets. And x is within the interval 2 to positive infinity. And of course, we could write that as x is less than negative 4 or x lies in between negative 1 and 0, or x is greater than 2 is the other way that we could write it. And that concludes this uh, video.